This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, with my very special guest from Buenos Aires, Lawrence DeMello, who's describing her research on the death of Princess Diana. Please, continue. Okay, well, let's get to the details of Diana in the car. Now, um, most people probably know that Diana was actually on site for uh, almost an hour before she was actually removed and put into an ambulance. Now, there are various witnesses. At the time of the crash, I was a bit suspicious of this this doctor that turned up, um, this Dr. Malier, who just happened to be driving the other direction. And when the crash came, they, obviously everybody heard the noise, the, the screaming of people that had heard, and he ran to the car. He didn't know it was the Princess of Wales. And he also uh, gave a statement that Diana was not trapped in the, in the car, which is contrary to the stories which were leaked by the French authorities at the time, which were released to the press. They couldn't get her out of the car, they had to call certain squads to cut her out of the car. It's absolutely not true. She was free to move in the car. Um, she was actually free enough that they actually administer, uh, this doctor gave her oxygen. He made sure her breathing away was clear. But she was actually conscious and speaking. Although she was in shock, she was speaking. And she was worried about, she was saying, oh my God, what's happened, blah, blah, blah. They tried to calm her down. So the fact had, is, had, she, had, she, had she or had she not been wearing her seatbelt? No, no, she did not. No, she did not. Um, and also, there are photographs early on taken by paparazzi as they pulled out of the ribs that you could see her fully turning around with her face to the back um, glass of the car. Uh, no, she wasn't strapped in. She was not strapped in. Um, but to be honest, I don't think that would have made much difference because um, I think she would have died anyway. Anyway, so she was free in the car, so there was no reason. Now, this doctor that first attended her, who gave her first, uh, first aid, he um, assessed her and he assumed that she had internal bleeding, which doctors, of course, can assess by her pulse and respiration rate, etc. Even though she was in shock, he was pretty sure that she had internal bleeding. Now, James, anybody that has internal bleeding, what is the, what is the one thing you have to do? You've got to get in there and you've got to stem the blood flow from wherever it's coming. Now, you are not going to put in um, an IV and pump loads and loads and loads of liquid into somebody if you know that there is a cut somewhere inside, there's some fatal bleeding point. You have to get in there and stop it. Now, she was left in the car for 43 minutes, James. 43 minutes. Now, we have to remember, this is the most famous woman in the world. So, the Dr. Melee, when he came on the scene, he was the one that first alerted the emergency services and an ambulance arrived 16 to 17 minutes later after the call that Melee made. So, we're talking now 19 minutes after the impact, the ambulance arrived. She was left in the car for up to 43 minutes and then she was put into the ambulance. Now, after she was placed in the ambulance, um, now, that's another query, let's go on there. Wouldn't you think it was, we're, we're not in Siberia here, we're in Paris. Now, would anywhere else, I know it happens on the M25 in London and there's a bad crash, what do you get? You don't call an ambulance, you get a bloody helicopter and they are airlifted because most of the big um, medical centers now have helipads yes. because of head injuries, internal bleeding, whatever. That's what they're there for. Why was she, why was there not a copter there ready to take her? They could land on that road, it was wide enough, it's dual carriageway. So I don't understand why she wasn't, well we do understand, but she wasn't airlifted to anywhere. She was then put into this ambulance and taken, she passed four major medical centers and was taken to a very, very relatively small, uh, La Piti La uh, Salpetier Hospital which was a four mile drive from the um, Alma Tunnel. Now four miles doesn't sound very long, but that's a long way in Paris because you know, Paris is small. And not only that, the four mile drive to this small hospital through empty streets, because it's early hours in the morning, the accident happened about 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, there's no credible explanation, James, why the ambulance stopped for 10 minutes outside the Natural History Museum, okay? which was only a few hundred yards, and the trip to get her there took also about 45, 46 minutes. What were they doing in there? Making, now, sure, the she was making sure she was dead. 
Well, here's the thing. The facts are Diana was not hospitalised until her condition had deteriorated to such a critical extent that by the time she got to the hospital, she'd suffered a series of heart attacks. She'd already had heart attacks in the tunnel. And on the way to the hospital, within minutes, she suffered a massive and fatal cardiac arrest. So when Diana actually got on the table into the, um, the resuscitation room, she was technically dead. Um, now that's pretty shocking when you think that this woman who had um, access to, I mean there was no concern about health insurance or anything, why she took almost two hours to get to a medical center. Um, and that's how she died. Now, let's go on now to Henry Paul. So let's leave Diana for a moment. We say Henry Paul. Now, what the verdict came to on the inquest, the inquest they said, was unlawful uh, killing. And they said that the percentage of toxins in the system was so abnormally excessive that he should have been, you know, suffering from symptoms of collapse and uh, dizziness and headaches, but he wasn't. Because there was footage of Henry Paul, um, everybody's seen the footage of him in the corridor downstairs with Dodie L5 and the princess where they're trying to plan which exit they're going out of. And he was completely compass mentis. Not only was he compass mentis, you could actually see him kneel down and do up one of his laces on his shoe. Now, a drunk man can't do that. Well, he can do it, but he, he can't well, do it. Well, he can try, that. but he can't tie his laces. Can't do it. Now, uh, the alcohol levels uh, were also supposedly so high that they were at least two times under the UK limit, three times over the French limit. Um, and so we have to look at that. Now, in the autopsy of Henri Paul, uh, according to the tests that were carried out by the French medical experts, um, they said the levels of carbon monoxide in Henri Paul's blood ranged between 12 and 21%. Now, the normal reading of carbon monoxide content in the average person's blood is between 2 and 4%. So we're talking, you know, he's got between 12 and 21%. Where did it come from? Where did that carbon monoxide come from in his blood? Now, there have been um, people that said, well, maybe he, when the crash happened, he inhaled uh, lethal amounts of carbon monoxide. Now, there are two points here. It's been proven that Henry Paul was dead on impact. Secondly, he had an airbag. Now, the airbag would have covered his face anyway, and he wouldn't have been able to breathe that in. But there were, he was certainly dead uh, on situ. So where did this carbon monoxide come from? Now, there was a, uh, an important uh, toxicologist, a Professor Robert Forrest, who was involved in the United Kingdom inquest. Now, the inquest was held. Um, anybody that dies, any British subject dies, if they're abroad, they're subject to an inquest. Now, this uh, professor said, his statement, quote, it was very, very unlikely that Mr. Paul could realistically have had such high levels of carb uh, carboxyhemoglobin concentration in his blood. And he also went on to say there was no rational explanation for the result. But, but unless, of course, the exhaust was being pumped into the driving compartment so that he would be deliberately affected by the carbon monoxide and lose his capacity, his judgment, and his steering ability? Well, um, I don't think it, it takes too long that the absorption of carbon monoxide, now the levels that Paul has in his blood, had in his blood, were consistent with somebody that had committed suicide through the, you know, parking your car in the garage yeah. and the tube from yeah. your exhaust pump into a closed compartment. Now, this is also interesting because I suspect, as others suspect, and I really do believe, his blood was substituted for uh, another uh, corpse that evening that was somebody that committed suicide who also had very high levels of alcohol in their blood. And the reason I'm convinced about that is because the family of Henri Paul requested that they have access to blood of his corpse for their own analysis, and they were flatly refused. Really? Yes. Because, of course, you, so, could do it, you could do DNA typing and discover it wasn't even his blood. Well, exactly. So he was not, they were not given access. So that's another major red flag. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Uh, that's an absurd denial, unless you're concealing facts. Exactly. So even this Professor Boris told the inquest on these findings, quote, 
One is left with either analytical error or a mystery. It's either conspiracy or a cock-up. No, come on. you telling me you're going to cock up on the driver who was involved in a fatal crash of the woman that was the most famous woman at the time in the world. I mean, come on. I mean, how could you cock up on that? It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So, okay, so we have that. So he also said that it was one of the things in the investigation that worried him more than anything. And he said there was no intellectual resolution which totally satisfies him. So, you know, we have to look at that. I mean, that's really, really um, a major um, sign that there's something not right here. You can't have, there are a law of averages. You can't have no CCTV, skid marks on the road, uh, carbon, high carbon monoxide levels in the blood. Now, let's go back to Diana now. Now, here's another thing. Now, Diana, anybody, I know when my mother had a sudden death, I went to the hospital immediately that morning, not knowing she was dead. I thought she was just taken ill. And I went in, of course, shocked you just lost somebody that you love very, very much. And um, I wanted to, I said to the doctor, I'm, I'm going, I'm coming straight back because I want to tidy mummy up. And um, I returned about 20 minutes later and of course she was gone. And I said, oh my gosh, where is she? And they said, no, 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 sorry, you're not allowed to touch her. Not even brush her hair because she is subject to an inquest because it's sudden death. So the fact is when a body is subject to inquest under British law, or in any uh, circumstance, a death crime scene, I mean, people watch so many of these television series, you do not touch the body. The body has to go fresh, untouched, unscathed to the coroner where the autopsy is carried out. Now, what happened to Diana when she gets to the hospital? Now, Diana was taken to a room and she was left in a room. Nobody said who did it. Nobody said who gave the order. Diana was injected with formaldehyde into her body. Now, formaldehyde? formaldehyde? Yes. So, formaldehyde, so this were an embalming? Formaldehyde is generally injected into a body to preserve it so it doesn't decompose too for rapidly. For burial, for burial. For burial, for burial. Now, you do not inject a body that is waiting to go for an autopsy. Yes, of course. Now, who gave the instructions for that? And how could that possibly have happened? Now, that's another reason I think that he, they were taken to this very small hospital. Because if she had been taken to a major center, they're not going to be complicit. You know, I mean, they're not aware of it. So I think she was taken to a small medical center where these people could be easily moved and manipulated and they could have done what they want. No, so she was injected with formaldehyde. Now, formaldehyde is an interesting uh, chemical because it has been suggested that the Princess of Wales was pregnant. Now, I have heard this, and I heard it from a very dear friend of mine who actually only died about a week ago. Um, who was uh, an eminent physician, and uh, he died, he was 90, so he wasn't young. And he was very connected to the French medical um, circuit. And he told me, and he was also a very close friend of Peter Shand, who was uh, Princess Diana's uh, stepfather. Peter Shand was married to Diana's mother. And he told me that he was told, and he was also a gynecologist, that she was indeed in the early months of pregnancy. Now. In the first weeks of pregnancy, James, um, women have a very high, um, they have a hormone, we have lots of hormones, but they have an HG, HCG hormone, and it's chorionic uh, gonadotropin, uh, gonadotropin or something. And what this, this is the one that we use when we did that sticky to see if we're pregnant in the first weeks, and this, the lines will come up. Now, as the pregnancy proceeds after about, um, nine weeks, this hormone level drops. Now, apparently, when you inject a female non-pregnant corpse with formaldehyde, it can give mis false positives of high levels of the HCG uh, hormone. So it's concealing so, or masking her pregnancy? Very, very possibly. Now, that's what I come to the conclusion, because I can't think of any other reason they would inject it with formaldehyde because formaldehyde could only do that. It could only be to give supposedly false readings of this hormone that is very high in the first weeks of pregnancy. Okay, now when we go back now to the tunnel and they talk about who was in the tunnel, the paparazzi, the scapegoats, there was a chase, they certainly did chase them. 
but you might have heard the stories about the the uh, infamous white fiat. Now yes. there was a right. Now we know who that was, and there was a white fiat that went into the tunnel, um, and it was found later. Mohammed Al Fayed actually got this information because there was actually it did actually collide with the Mercedes, and there was white paint on the Mercedes that was taken for forensic analysis later, and they actually tracked it down to this white Fiat that was owned by James Anderson, who was a paparazzi, a very wealthy paparazzi, and he was there that night. Now, James, um, that night, apparently, his whole of his apartment was turned over in Paris, his hard drive was taken, um, his um, place was, it, it was a raid, he was raided. Now that night, his family had confirmed that he actually took a flight to Corsica, basically he got out of there. Now it was initially believed that he had photographs of what had happened, so obviously these people were looking at his cameras, etc. Now, uh, Anderson, he disappeared, and two years later he was found in France, in his car, in his Fiat, and he was burned to death, supposedly in a suicide. Now, <laughs> this is interesting because the car was locked from the outside, um, and um, the body was completely burned, and it was believed that he was under pressure, and he was frightened, and he killed himself. Now, only last year, it's come out now, there's been a statement by the French um, fire brigade, a chap in the French fire brigade that said that he was on the site, and he has considered it for a long time, he finally came out that he is absolutely convinced that Anderson had two bullet wounds to the head when he removed the corpse. I mean, these men are very, very trained. The, the burnt corpse had two bullet holes to the head. Yeah, so it's come out now. And in fact, if anybody, anybody Googles now um, James Anderson... It's, it's, it's tough to commit yourself, commit suicide by shooting yourself multiple times in the head. <laughs> So anyway, but they, not to it, mention then setting yourself on fire. Well, well, exactly. So you know, I mean, there are so many things going that, you know, that 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 it's very very concerning that you know people can. Do you know the press? Nobody wants to put it on one page. And the problem we have, James, is with these things that happen, whether it be nine eleven or whether it be David Kelly. Nobody in their day-to-day -day life, they're all trying to put sort of, they're working, putting food on the table. They don't have the time to sit down like you and I do and put all the pieces of the jigsaw to, to, together. And if a newspaper could print all the bullets, all the bullets, then maybe people would look at it and go, oh my gosh, oh goodness, you know, there's something here. But of course, Diana will never, ever, it will never come out. Um, I buried it in the end because I realized I was whipping a dead horse. It was something I knew that was getting me into serious trouble. And in all the work that I've done, that was the one thing that really um, concerned, concerned me in that I think that I, I, my safety was seriously at risk. So uh, as I have, I'm a mother of children, I thought that I'd back off on that. And anyway, you know, much better investigators than me had sort of disappeared because they were sort of close on the tail. So. Yeah, I'm absolutely convinced that Prince of Wales, Princess of Wales was assassinated. Unfortunately, Dodie L. Fyde was also a victim to that. And the interesting thing is Trevor Reese jones who was the bodyguard, and he survived. Um, of course, he lost his tongue. <laughs> That's quite symbolic, isn't it? You know that. Yes. Um, he, his tongue was severed in the incident. And um, he has never, ever spoken. And um, it's just uh, a shocking... Well, it's like the, the Kennedy assassination, you know, even now, how many years later, I mean, you, you never get to the bones of it. Even without and his tongue, he could, he could write or type or use a computer. There are many ways he could communicate if he were so desirous, but of course he doesn't want to lose no, no, his no, other, no, no. other he, body you know, parts. I believe, I believe he was well paid off. And remember, we had also Paul Burrell, who was Diana's um, butler and right hand. And he actually revealed letters of Diana saying that she did believe it was Charles that was trying to murder her. I do not believe that for one minute. And I do not believe for one minute uh, the Queen was involved. There is another member of the family, who I, uh, royal family, who I do believe could be connected to, to a conspiracy to murder the Princess of Wales. But I'm not going to say that. But certainly not the Prince of Wales. 
and certainly not the Queen. I absolutely believe that, James. Well, I think you're quite right that the, the powerful, you know, military industrial manufacturers of landmines and so forth who would want to see Diane stop her campaign, and the only way they could do that would be by killing her, would it be the most likely suspects who would also have powerful enough connections in international uh, you know, law enforcement, security, and all that, that they could make the kinds of arrangements you have described having been made to for her death and to ensure she did die, including, of course, the, the ambulance, which is undoubtedly uh, one that was predetermined to be there, just as the automobile was predetermined to be used, just as the hospital, the small hospital, was predetermined to be used, just as the injection of formaldehyde was predetermined to be used. You've had... Uh, outline the elements of a rather substantial conspiracy here that may have had a relatively small number of participants, but I think the design is unmistakable. Absolutely, absolutely. And I also want to make it clear while we're talking on that, I really, really, you hear so much today because you know we have so many people that, which is great, lots of people are getting on board, analyzing events that have happened over the last years etc. We talk about the New World Order and we talk about, you know, conspiracy. But I have to say, the British royal family get really bad press and it's really not justified. You know, everybody's saying, oh, they're reptilians and they have done this and they've done that. Not at all. Let me tell you, Her Majesty the Queen has done a marvellous job. She's been a brilliant monarch. And not only that, she is told what to do. She is told what to do. She is not controlling everything as people suspect. She is told what to do. And uh, she does her job and she gets on with it. And that's it. And uh, she's done a bloody good job of doing that, I think. So, yeah, well, um, Lawrence, I'm willing to go along with you on all of that in relation to the royal family. Who would be the powers behind the throne? You mean Parliament and the PM? Well, higher than that, higher than that, although I have to say Tony Blair, Tony Blair, I would put him as, as a master uh, a culprit, uh, I mean, let's look at the Iraq war, but I would say much, it's much more sinister than that, there is a group, there is a cabal up there, James, I don't know who they are, I don't think we're ever going to be able to expose it. Well, are we talking about okay. the, the bankers, uh, the Rothschilds in the city of London? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I haven't gone that far because, you know, I know there's no way I'm going to get through there. But those are the ones that pull the strings. You know, it's much higher. You know, have mem M MPs in the House of Parliament, they sit there. I mean, look how they were absolutely, you know, uh, duped into getting the justification for this war in Iraq, which we'll go on to when we talk about Dr. David Kelly. Yes, perfect, perfect. This is ideal time for us to take our second break. This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, with my very special guest from Buenos Aires, Lawrence DeMello. You've already heard her analysis of the death of Princess Diane. More to come. We'll be right back.